Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Silva and today I'll be talking about PowerShell IoT V2, what is new, what changed and what I've learned. PSConf U 2020 wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, so thank you for each one of them. As for our agenda, I'll give you some context why IoT V2 and explain to you a little bit about the PowerShell IoT if you haven't heard about it. We'll be looking at uh, C Sharp and converting C Sharp to PowerShell code. This was supposed to be another session, but due to the circumstances, uh, I wasn't able to present both of them. So I think I was more familiar with the IoT V2 and I'll try to give you some context for uh, C Sharp and use PowerShell code with that. About the what's new, what's new and what changed, we'll be seeing new libraries, breaking changes and uh, possibilities for implementations, which are the bindings that we'll be discussing. Finally, I'll show you what I've learned and share with you how you can learn as well. It's really easy. And I also try to encourage you to contribute to the project. So as for context, PowerShell IoT is a PowerShell module which allows you to interact with IoT devices such as LEDs and sensors and so on. I've been using it for about, about two years and last year I've done two sessions about it at PSConf U. So I recommend you go check them on their YouTube channel. And right before I presented them, like two, one or two weeks before, Steve Lee approached me and asked me if I wanted to become a maintainer of, of this repo. Uh, it came as a surprise to me because although, as I said, I've been using it for the past two years, I've only done some projects like hobby, hobby projects and I haven't even contributed much to the GitHub project. But since I was spreading the word and I was trying to improve the code, he asked me if I wanted to become a maintainer and I accepted it for two main reasons. The first one is that it's, it's something that I enjoy. I enjoy using the IoT and it also allows me to learn more about PowerShell and how to contribute to open source projects. There are some things that change once you go from uh, a contributor to a maintainer. And that's something that I will try to show you here today. This session won't be focused on displaying LEDs blinking like, like the ones last year. It will be more focused towards how can you contribute to open source projects and what it's like to become a maintainer of a project. So hopefully this will give you some insights and motivate you to contribute to more projects. So this module is based on C-sharp code mainly. So I'll try to give you some context and some overview of C-sharp and how can you read C-sharp and convert C-sharp to PowerShell code before introducing you the changes and what's new. So we'll try to get familiar with C-sharp and you'll see that it's quite easy once you know PowerShell to read C-sharp code. I'm doing this because last year there was a poll about uh, PowerShell devs using C-Sharp and I think it was around 90% didn't know C-Sharp or don't want to use C-Sharp. So let's try to do some overview and demystify the whole C-Sharp thing. Let's take a look at the code. So in my case, I've already cloned the Raspberry, the IoT repo, PowerShell IoT repo. And here we'll take a look at the get I2C device. So as you can see here, we have a source folder there are plenty of different uh, uh, interfaces, either the GPIO, the I2C and the SPI, which are the ones that we are currently supporting. And in the I2C, we'll take a look at the I2C device, which is one of the ones that I used during my last sessions, where I've led, light up the, some LED matrix to display some text. And in this case, the code is pretty straightforward. So we have here a class, we have here some attributes, we have the constructor and the process record method. Breaking those into different chunks, we can see here first that we have the, the attributes, which are which also have an attribute, per, uh, uh, an attribute which is called the parameter attribute. And here we specify uh, different requirements such as if it's the parameter is mandatory, the value from pipeline by property name uh, can be set to true or false and the, the, and the position. So in this case, the ID 
uh, has the mandatory set to true it can accept value from the pipeline by property name and the position is set to be the zero so as you can see here this is the only parameter that has that is mandatory other parameters such as the friendly name and the buzz id are set to false so what happens here is that when you when you compile this code and then you try and, and then you run you import the module and run the code you can set the get which is the the verb that we specified get dash i2c device and you all only have to specify the id so the friendly name and the buzz id are not mandatory and when you don't specify them this is where the constructor comes into place so the friendly name will be an empty string and the buzz id will be the default of one so if you take a look at the code here i've i'm connected to my raspberry which is a raspberry pi 4 that came uh, after the ps configure session uh, the raspberry pi 4 was released and i have the 4 gig model but this also works on the 3b on the 2b and if you want to know the limitations, you can check my other presentation about why, does the, why doesn't this work with the Pi 0W, for example. But here I'm already on PowerShell and I've compiled the code, but I can compile here. I won't be uh, copying the, the output to my Raspberry in order to avoid uh, spending more time on that. But we can compile the code by doing .NET publish and we say minus r which is the runtime and we say linux arm so this code will compile instantly and you can see that we generate a folder called linux arm and the, we have a published folder which is the one that i've copied here so this folder has all the required dll's that we need to use uh, in order to use our module so in this case, I'll be using the DLL method, uh, or so I call it the DLL method. So I'll do import module and specify the DLL because at this moment uh, we don't have, uh, or at least I haven't compiled a way to, to get the module by itself. So I can do import module here and specify the, in this case, it's dot slash Microsoft dot powershell sorry powershell iot dot dll and if i do a get dash i2c device so we can see here that i have an i2c region and the device and if i type enter it says that i need to specify the id so in this case i i don't have any i2c device connected so i'll just specify a random id here and this will probably it did, didn't draw an error but as you can see, we have a friendly name that is an empty. We have an ID and a buzz ID. So what happens if I specify the ID to be the two? And if I set a friendly name as some psconf view, we can see here that we have the same buzz ID, ID two, and it's psconf view. So I won't be able to do anything here because I, I don't have any I2C device connected at the moment, but this so that you can get an overview about how uh, how this this code works so same goes for the set i2c register we have some parameters here that are mandatory in this case most of them are mandatory we don't have a constructor because in this case most of the uh, all the parameters that are um, important are mandatory so when you do process record so let me take a step back this set i2c register as the name imply will set a value or a data to a register so we need to specify a device which in this case would be the device that we just created previously we will need to define to which register we, we want to to write the code the data and what data do we want to write and the pass through in this case is set to mandatory to be false so this process record what this will do is that this will create a data out we'll write to that device and then we if, if we specify the the pass through we'll also write the, the object that we just created so there are some syntax here that changed from our previous library to this one this is all as you can see this is leveraging the stack alloc and it's also using spans so 
although we don't expect to see much uh, much of a difference in this case uh, this is also being optimized uh, with memory allocations so this stack alloc and the span will reduce uh, or is expected to reduce uh, the memory allocation for our functional code but because in this case for example the the i2c register this will be a, a little only a little bit of data if the memory allocation that we'll see on the PowerShell won't be uh, noticeable but this is just another example uh, of uh, a method that we are implementing and as I said we have the implementations for uh, the different interfaces that we have which are the GPIO the I2C and the, the SPI Again, uh, let me rem remind you that this is still in development, so we are still migrating to this new, pro uh, this new library. And this is what I hope to do with this presentation is that uh, I try I'm trying to motivate you to also contribute to this code. So again, this is just an overview of the C Sharp code and hopefully you get an idea about how you can read the code. The, at least this code is pretty simple. Uh, there are many there are code that which is way more difficult to read but in this case we try to do it as simple as we can and so with that said what's new and what changed there are some major changes with also introduced breaking changes so when i presented this session uh, or the, the iot session last year the powershell iot module was relying on a library called the unosquare.raspberry.io and this this library introduced some breaking changes rega regarding the pin IDs so which would cause that if you if you had a script running that used the pin 1 and they changed that pin to be instead of 1 to be 5 that will that will break your code and at first we tried to avoid that because we didn't want to introduce a breaking change of that dimension which would cause your script to totally stop running and we went to their uh, repo and created an issue saying like please try not to implement this breaking change at least for now because we have a library which is using yours and that will introduce a breaking change also for our customer and they said that that was required but then they took a step back and said we'll try to make it uh, work with our old implementation and new implementation and it was floating around a bit while we weren't able to uh, improve our code but then there was this uh, sad news that the wiring pi which if you are not aware uh, i showed this the last year but to make a quick recap the powershell iot module is relying as i said on the uno square raspberry io uh, library which itself was relying on a c library so it was a wrapper for a C library called the wiring pi and unfortunately that that uh, library became deprecated so in the end this change these breaking changes would be implemented either if we stick with the uno square raspberry io library or if we change to a new one so we've decided to change to the dotnet iot uh, libraries in that case it it also means that the whole implementation will be in the Microsoft ecosystem. So this is an advantage for us. This repo, the .NET IoT repo, introduces two new libraries, which is the System Device GPIO and the IoT Device Bindings libraries. And for now, we are not only using the System Device GPIO, but we expect to be using the IoT Device Bindings soon. And I'll explain you what is this binding, what are these bindings, and why is that this can be such a game changer for us with that said as for the breaking changes there is now on the powershell iot repo on the issues tab uh, a label for the breaking changes this allows you to quickly find out what are the breaking changes and what are the procedures that you have to take in order to migrate your code to comply with those breaking changes as i said uh, on the beginning of this session this won't be a session with LEDs blinking and uh, sensors taking uh, measurements about temperature and what whatsoever but mo more importantly this will be about the open source contributions what I've learned from it what it's like to become a maintainer and for that reason I think that it's important to discuss or to analyze why is that the wiring pipe became deprecated and 
for me there there was a, a huge deal a huge deal not only for the fact that one of the most used uh, c libraries became deprecated but more for the fact of why it, why did that became deprecated and for that let's take a look at the 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 blog posts if you search for wiring pi deprecated you'll land on this page which is a blog post made by the uh, the gordon who is the maintainer of the wiring pi library and as he said this has become a bit of a rant and i suggest that you that you read the whole blog post it's not that that long and it touches on some key points that will i will try to resume so this started as someone who had some knowledge on C and RTB basic and for the past 10 years has been implementing code fixes, inf uh, new features and bugs for uh, such library. And he states that this is not a newbie learning tool. So this was made for someone that had experience as, as I've said before on C and RTB basic. So the fact is that I, I don't think that he was expecting that but this became widely adopted for not only C programmers but also people who wanted to use use it for C sharp and many other languages so what happened was that this took huge proportions in the fact that there were many issues that he came across that were people using uh, developing code relying on this library that then uh, used static links which caused him to have more than 10,000 emails from people who suddenly upgraded their pi and the code stopped working and other than that that made, made him feel hugely depressed and sad so again this made him become physical and uh, ment mentally uh, debilitated there are many issues with that and this is something that is real so this for me probably the most the most important part for this session is that you take pay attention and take notice that when there are people that are using doing uh, open source contributing to open source software or maintaining open source software you can't expect them to fix your issue in less than 24 hours or expect them to explain everything to you by detail they are not obliged to and they are doing that on most likely on their free time and because it's something that they enjoy to do and if those things accumulate over time like like it happened for the last 10 years for gordon what we'll probably like is are many cases like this one which is that people who became like uh, sad uh, me with mental health, depressed, physically debilitated and that is something that is really important and our health becomes before anything else. So then again, just to give you some context, there were people that were trying to make this code work on other Pi implementations like the, the Orange Pi and so on. But when they changed the code, they left his email as a support contact so what happened is that most likely people were trying to use the wiring pi on other platforms and he was receiving emails for devices that he probably never heard about and people were trying to contact him make asking him to support something that it wasn't supposed to work or it's not something that he designed to work and this became huge and moreover there were people complaining about saying that the pin number was was weird and as you can that, that is why there there is this breaking change for us is because before we were using a wiring pi num pin number and now we are using what is called the python pin number which is the one that are the, the the pin that is set on the board and as he said the final straw was that someone complained about him not releasing the sources for the fourth version of the Pi uh, in a timely manner. So the fact is that not only Gordon was doing this for the free time and investing his personal time on that for free, but there were people complaining that 
and claiming that when you are using some kind of license in this case the the lgpl license it requires you and notice the caps here to make the sources available when it's released so then again as you as you can as you can consider this is something that it's a burden for someone when you invest so much so much time on something that you are doing for fun and for free and you don't expect to take the proportion that it does and then comes someone complaining about like hey uh, I have this issue I need you to fix this or why is this not working and you don't answer me in like 24 hours or you are obligated to do something like this and this caused the wiring pipe to become deprecated and if you look if you search on the on Google on whatever you use you'll see that the wiring pipe is widely used on many different projects and this is one of the reasons why we migrated to a new library because wiring pipe became deprecated and the other library that we were using that relied on wiring pipe also changed to another one so again if you take nothing else from this session please consider that whenever someone is, is doing uh, some contributions to open source or someone is maintaining open source software they are not ob obligated to answer you in like 24 hours or implement a new feature that you think that it's good for your use case immediately and it's important to pay attention to those signs especially if you know someone that is contributing it's maintaining some code and showing signs of that fatigue so this is just something that I wanted you to, to pay attention to. Now going back to, to our bindings, let's see what are the, those bindings and why is that this can be such a game changer for us. So for that we'll go check the .NET IoT repo and in this case if you see the, the, the readme they, also, they already state here that this contains the device IoT bindings, which are a growing set of community maintained device bindings for IoT components. What this means is that most of these, the, these bindings or these code implementations are made by, by the community members. So they are tested and are already working. And if you click on this link, we go to the, the, the readme for those bindings. And as you can see, we have many, many different devices uh, already implemented. So if we read the, the beginning of this, it says that it's intended for device bindings such as sensors, displays, and human interface devices, or anything else that requires software control. So if we take a look, for example, let's say the, the passive infrared motion sensor, which is essentially a sensor that detects by infrared when there is some any uh, when there is any kind of movement, there is already this code being used. So, whoever implemented this already implemented this HCR uh, HCSR five zero one, and this already has implemented the, this is using the device the device library system.devices and if we take a look let's let's jump back into the sources devices and we have to search here for the H HCSR and as you can see there this is something that's already done so if we want to use this in PowerShell in theory all we have to do is simply import this code and just use it but in practice it's not that simple because as you can see here this require this already has an sln and there is the the class that has implementation for this sensor so as you can see here this is using the system device gpio so whoever implemented this code has already done the the whole logic for this sensor in specific uh, to work with our C sharp code or in our case with our PowerShell code. So all we would have to do is simply create an uh, HCS, uh, HCRS501 implementation for that in PowerShell, which would create a new, a new uh, instance of this object and implement this uh, is motion detected. So, but the question here 
and this is something that uh, hasn't uh, hasn't been discussed yet uh, i've been thinking about this but didn't come to any conclusion yet is how is that we can leverage from this code that is already implemented for our implementation so that we don't have to create this whole code uh, by our hands and when i started to to work on this and this is some this is the other really cool thing about the open source software and working with such amazing teams is that the guys from the .NET IoT uh, know that I've started to work on this and reach out to me and said, "Hey, let's discuss uh, what is that you need, what is that we already have, and how can you leverage from that? If you have any issues, we can you can contact me or you can contact anyone from from my team and." Let's let's try to discuss how can how is that we can use the bindings and this is something that is still open but there was this idea of like uh, what if we have some kind of JSON that tells me that whenever there is a change our code automatically updates or wh whenever there is this new binding someone changes this JSON and our code scraps from this repo and implements it itself so. In this case, what would be the really cool was that whenever you, there was someone that implemented a new binding in the, the optimal scenario, our code will also have support for that without us having to implement this. So essentially, this is what, is a, this is what a binding is. A binding is uh, an implementation for a specific device that someone made that already has the the whole logic for that specific sensor or for that specific led or for that specific display and we in this case the the powershell iot repo does not have to worry about this implementation because it will be agnostic to us all we would have to do is something like uh, create device and specify the device name or create sensor and the sensor name and the whole code behind it would be implemented by the C sharp. And if you have any idea or any suggestions about how is that something like this can be achieved in an easy way, please jump into the, the issues, create a new issue saying like, uh, I have this the, I have a suggestion for the bindings and let's discuss that. And we are totally open for such discussions. And as you can see, or as you can try to imagine, we, there's currently all of these devices already implemented. And if there was something that we could do for our codes, it would probably be another module, but something that would probably do something like scrapping or something like that to extract the codes to our implementation. Again, we wouldn't have to implement all of these and out of the box we would have around 40 or 50 devices already working with PowerShell, which would be something that will be really amazing. So again, if you have any idea, how can we achieve that? Please go into issues, create a new issue and discuss that with us. I would love to hear the feedback, any suggestions, and please do that. <laughs> so that resumes the, the bindings. But, oh, and I forgot to about the, the, the whole code changes or some of the basic code changes. And as I said, on our, on our repo, on the issues tab, we have um, a label. We have a new label for the breaking changes. And in this case, it's not because it's open, but if you, if you search, as I said, there are the GPIO pin changes and changes of pin. So if you open the issue, you can read why is that there, this change was introduced, what happened, and how can you mitigate the code for, for that change. So in this case, it's for the pin layout. And another breaking change that we introduced is that because we changed the library and that also brings changes to how the code is implemented, uh, the GPIO pin now requires you to specify a GPIO controller. So as far as we've been implemented, our code that our code that is already working, this uh, one of the, the the breaking changes that we introduced, and I can show you that really quickly here. That is that 
we now have a GPIO command line base which has the, the basic implementation for the GPIO pins which is something that is used across our GPIOs so we now have the possibility to ensure that a pin uh, must be open so that this doesn't throw any exception other than the breaking change we, are introdu we introduced uh, some optimizations on how we deal with exceptions so when we try to to add the range we we check first if the pin is is open and if only if the pin is open we'll read the value from that pin and output the data for that so again these are the two main changes that were introduced everything else that you were able to use until we migrated the code we'll still be able to use that there are also other changes that we'll introduce for example on the i2c which is one of the pull requests that I have open for now. There is uh, currently a draft that I've created because there are some changes for, for that device, for that, um, for that interface, sorry. And probably many other breaking changes will be introduced. So this will be like a, a revamp of the code or a PowerShell IoT V2, if you want to call it, that we are trying to, to, to introduce and that takes me to the part of where, what i've learned so far so although there's still plenty of code to be implemented and changes to be done as you've seen i've already learned how to properly contribute to a project although this is something that is uh, continuous learning so there is always, always something that will change and some some more, so many more things that will learn so but so far i've learned how to properly create an issue how to label the issue so that it's easier for the others to search for it or how to to review codes on github and how to manage pull requests which i'll try to show you uh, right after this um, i've learned how to get some uh, or i've got some notions on how to maintain a repo again by trying to make the the codes as readable as possible or comp uh, comments on some of the code that someone made when I don't agree with that or something that does not comply with our standard for codes or uh, how to properly uh, document a pull request so whenever I made a pull this is a personal uh, my personal approach for that but when I make a pull request I try for example to specify why I'm making that uh, that pull request if that breaks something if that if it does why does it break how to mitigate that that situation so there are some some notions that you gain whenever you contribute to open source projects or when you try to maintain a repo and although that it's not always easy uh, i can guarantee you that it's worth it because it's really really good to to see when, when you when you comment something that you don't agree with or when you show your uh, your point of view which is different from the one that implemented the code and they agree with you or when they say like uh, I don't agree with you because of this or that and you get the idea that okay you are wrong but at least you know why you are wrong and how can you what can you do uh, to make it better or the 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 fact that when someone creates a pull request and assigns you to review that it makes you feel that you have something good to contribute with uh, or even if you don't contribute with anything at least someone told you like hey i'm trusting you to review this code so please comment your changes uh, do whatever you, you have to do and the fact that you feel that you you can contribute and what you say has some value makes it feel really worth to contribute to to code and that's something that i want you to take from this but also as i said on my on this last point with great power comes great responsibility so the fact that i'm now a maintainer on the powershell iot repo also makes me to feel uh, more responsible for what i do so i am responsible for when when someone makes a pull request and if i'm the one to approve that I have to be responsible for whatever happens in that pull request so if there's any bug my, my personal opinion is that it will be my responsibility because i'm the one that approved that pull request 
or if that pull request does not comply with our standards and I'm the one that merged it, I'm responsible for that. So although it feels good, it also makes you feel that you have more responsibility. And I'm not saying that it's something that it's bad. Uh, for me, it's quite the opposite because it makes you feel that whatever decisions you make, you make them, but you are thinking about what you are doing. And in the end, if everything works fine, you feel real well because, okay, so I've merged something, I've reviewed something that it's working, it's uh, working as expected and someone comply with that. And that is really good. So let's, let's try to see uh, how to review code on GitHub and how to merge or how to manage the, the pull requests. And for that, we'll go back to our PowerShell IoT repo. And there's uh, actually a, a pull one pull request open, which I've created on April 15. And this is to an, uh, add a uh, suggestion to add uh, a S SPI device. And the reason why I'm suggesting this change is because again, with the changes from the, the old library to the, the, the .NET IoT one, there are some, some bindings and some code that requires some changes. In this case, I was testing the WS2812B, which are usually called the NeoPixels. And when I was tr check, trying this code, there were some, some fields that were being set that I, I needed to have control, but with our current implementation, I didn't have contr uh, the control of that. So my suggestion is that we should have an SPI device that will allow us to specify more uh, more settings, so that we have we give the user uh, the chance to override or to set whatever values they want to, and if they don't need that, we'll use the default values. So, again, this is my personal approach. I usually try to make a comment on uh, what is this pull request about. Why do I think that something is required or do, why do I think that something should be changed? Or if it's uh, a breaking change, why is that the breaking change and what caused that breaking change and uh, whatsoever. In this case, I've opened this pull request. I made a commit with some with four files changed and there are currently uh, three people reviewing uh, this code or this pull request. So, for example, Tyler reviewed the file and made some comments, I've replied, then Andrew, uh, who is also a collaborator, came, uh, came to, to join the discussion and shared his opinion. And I said, I've commented on about what did he say. So this is the really cool part about uh, this. Uh, notice that this is not uh, only on the maintainer side, but this is what usually happens whenever someone, either a maintainer or some, someone just who just wants to contribute, create a pull request. Usually there are people who review the code, make suggestions uh, against uh, what the, 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 the person who created the pull request created. So in this case, again, I've created a pull request to add a new feature. They've commented, they've shared their opinion. Uh, I've learned uh, things that I didn't know before and they discussed saying that uh, there are some things that they don't agree uh, that we shouldn't rely on something uh, or some of the defaults that, I, that I've assumed that we could rely on and so this is still a pull request I have to pick up uh, read once again the changes that, that they've, they've, uh, they've comment and then uh, submit a more commits to this pull request and ask them to review once again. But this is the site for when you create a pull request. So what, it, what does it look like when you want to review uh, some pull request? For example, Tyler here reviewed this pull request and suggested some changes. And if I press here on the view changes, this will open a, a new window or a new page with uh, a different view. So this, again, this is the file change. So this is the same as jumping here from the conversation to the files changed. And we, here I can start my, my reviews. So 
for example i have here a pending review saying that i don't something so let me just delete this and if i say for example that uh, i don't think that this parameter should be uh, mandatory or, or i think that this parameter should be mandatory so i would say i think that this sh sorry this should be mandatory and in this case i'll i can start a review so what this does is that this marks this comment as a pending one and as you can see here with the one whenever i comment or any other place or even if it's if it if it is this only one when i'm finished i just type whatever i want to do and this will uh, comments with all the, the the comments that i've said before so i just delete this one so that i don't accidentally commit this this is just for the demo but as you can see here for example uh, andrew suggested something and i've commented he replied so this is pretty straightforward interface where you can see for example i can see he says that yes it's raw i can comment for example oh okay i see that and i mark this as resolved or there are cases where they, they suggest something i don't agree or i'm not familiar with something i ask them to reply and this allows us to have a really quick flow to see what do we think that it's correct or it's not and allows me to easily review the the pull request so whenever i view the file that i change i can mark them as viewed so whenever i review in this case the four files i can try i can comment saying that i approve these changes or i comment say that here are my 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 changes or my suggestions or i can suggest changes saying i don't agree with this please change this file and then in the end i submit a review and what will happen is something similar to this that whenever someone replies this will create this whole thread with the comments that everyone uh, is sharing and this is essentially what a review looks like so we've seen how to how does a pull request look like and how uh, and what does a review file look like so just to finish this uh all I have to, to say, all I have left to say is please contribute to this project or any project that you find interesting or that you think that you can leverage. Uh, in this case, please, if you have any suggestions, any, any ideas, or if you are just curious, bring your ideas, uh, join this project, create issues, uh, bring your suggestions, your implementations, whatever you think that uh, you can contribute with even if it's a simple a simple pull request with some minor fixes or uh, code variable names changes whatever Th this is how you get you get started if you are not familiar with you, you can make some simple changes the community will help you and you will feel that where although it's something simple you feel that you've made something that has changed and at and it has some impact on the product that you might or might not use so as i said you can contribute to an awesome project and talk to amazing people like i'm currently doing with the other maintainers and people who contribute to the powershell iot so i strongly encourage you to to do so as well this, uh, because that's how i started and now i'm currently a maintainer so that's something that's really great i'm really grateful for so just to wrap everything up we in this session we've seen uh, why i've created another iot session uh, although it's it refers to iot uh, as i've said before the the whole point is more about talking about open source contributions and the issues that uh, there are unfortunately with, with some of the um, the open source projects how can you contribute with code what are the possibilities that you have we also viewed the we have we've made a quick overview about c sharp code so i've tried to show you quickly how can you read uh, our code in a really easy way since you already have knowledge about powershell we've also discussed what's new and what changed the new libraries that we were introduced what are the breaking changes and finally what are the bindings and how powerful they can be to our implementations and finally i've shared with you uh, what i've learned so 
the slides and the, the demo codes uh, will be available on the, the PowerShell, uh, the PSConf EU GitHub. Uh, in my case, I don't have uh, any demos uh, or code at least, but the slides will be there. And about me, uh, I'm a software developer. I work with .NET Core and Entity Framework Core. As I told you, uh, I've started working with PowerShell, uh, not related to the work, but since I knew C Sharp, I thought that it would be easier for me to learn C, uh, PowerShell and the the opposite it's valid as well so as you can see you can read c sharp code although you don't know c sharp so hopefully this this is also motivation for you to learn c sharp if you're not familiar with it and finally i'm a, I, a di and iot enthusiast and that's everything i have to share with you remember that there will be uh, the psconf 2021 in and over germany on june next year so please check up check the the website for more information and thank you for joining me